Well, good morning, church family. If you will, take your Bibles and turn with me again to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 as we're going to pick up where we left off last week as we continue our journey through the book of 2 Timothy. As Luke mentioned a few moments ago, uh, this is giving us a lens into how disciples multiply and make disciples. So uh, this relationship that Paul had with Timothy, Paul even writing from a dungeon in Rome, uh, doesn't see uh, that opportunity as being one that hinders him in any way from doing what the Lord has called him to do. So he is pouring in and investing in Timothy, who then is going to invest in others, specifically the, the church in which he is leading. Uh, and so as we think about this passage, uh, we have been talking a lot about this idea of the importance of groups, uh, that really uh, there is an incredible opportunity for us to gather, uh, to sit under the instructions of God's word, to worship together. But most of our spiritual growth happens in those small group type Bible studies. And so we often, of course, are encouraging you guys and we've been really blessed uh, this season to hear how many of you are interested in groups and engaging uh, in new ways and starting new groups. But we talk about the, the good values of that. But have you ever been part of a group that wasn't so good? Have you ever been part of a group gone wrong? I have. Uh, and let me tell you the story about that. When I was 19 years old, I was asked to be a youth pastor of a little country Baptist church in South Central Illinois near where I went to college. Uh, and so uh, I thought, how hard can this be, right? They offered me a whopping 100 bucks a week uh, to do a Bible study with some teenagers. And so my first assignment was to start a Wednesday night Bible study. And I thought, this is great. I remember a few games from my youth group days, right? I'll open up the Bible, find something to talk about for a few minutes. We'll eat cookies and chips and we'll have a great time. Here's a picture of that little church. Here's a picture uh, of those young men. There were about five to seven junior high boys. There were a couple of sisters who occasionally dared to come, right? Uh, with this bunch of boys. But as we're going to see in this passage today, there are eight imperatives that Paul gives. I broke just about every one of them with this group, right? This group of kids, they were a handful. And so Paul's going to tell us, right, to not argue about words. Ever been around some middle school boys, right? So there was a lot of arguments that broke out, whether it was about the game we were playing or who was in line first to, to get snacks. I mean, it just seemed like one thing led to another. Uh, Paul's going to say, be diligently about teaching the word of truth. These young guys were way more interested in what kind of cookies I brought for them to eat than they were the word of God. And sadly, I'd give in, right? At some point, it just wasn't going well, and I would just completely give up. He goes on to talk about, uh, you know, needless quarrels and controversies in this passage. Well, one time we were playing a game and one kid got into it with another. And then they started this little mini gang war at this church. So my youth group attendance increased, but not because they were coming to hear the gospel, because they were coming so they could fight in the parking lot after youth group was over. And I'm not even joking. And so I went back to my dorm room one night and I was going to write a letter of resignation to the pastor and deacons, but I couldn't remember how many eyes were in the word resignation. So I pulled out my journal instead and I began to journal, just kind of pour out my heart on the page as I've done different points in my life. God, I'm a failure. I don't know what you were thinking, asking a guy like me to work with a group of kids like this. I, 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 if I can't handle a handful of middle school boys, what will I ever do for you? And in that moment, I heard the still small voice of the Spirit, not telling me what I wanted to hear, but telling me what I needed to hear. And that was this, Jay, it won't ever be about what you do for me. It'll always be about what I do through you. I needed to hear that. A couple weeks later, I'll come across 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so I began to lean in, and by the grace of God, the bivocational pastor of that little church, a man by the name of Tom Rankin, pulled me aside into his office and said, Jay, hang in there. He said, you can do this. I was a young and frustrated and discouraged Timothy. He was an older and much wiser Paul to me in that moment. He said, let's think about this for a minute. You know, you're complaining about the behavior of these boys, right? And I was just frustrated. He said, what do they lack in their life? They have no male role models. They've had no one to share the gospel with them. You see, you can't just use behavior modification to reach these boys. What they need is Jesus. And he was right. And so that began a journey 
And so slowly but surely, things turned around, and I was able to lead that little group for three years, and I learned a lot of lessons about ministry by doing what? Just getting in there and doing it. I learned that it wasn't easy, right? You have to be a diligent worker to get the word of truth into lives, no matter the age. I learned that the way that I lived, right, the behavior that I exhibited before these boys was in parallel with the things that I taught them, that I needed to be a living example of that. I learned, right, what it means to surf and what it meant to put their spiritual needs ahead of maybe my preferences and walk alongside of them. All these lessons and more is what Paul is teaching Timothy in the second half of chapter two. Last week, he used these word pictures for us, right? That a disciple maker is a dedicated soldier, a disciplined athlete, a diligent farmer. Now Paul is going to give us three more. Will you stand with me in honor of God's word as we read from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to fight about words. This is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. Be diligent to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed, correctly teaching the word of truth. Avoid irreverent and empty speech since those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness and their teaching will spread like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are among them. They have departed from the truth saying that the resurrection has already taken place and are ruining the faith of some. Nevertheless, God's solid foundation stands firm, bearing this inscription, the Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who calls on the name of the Lord turn away from wickedness. Now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also those of wood and clay, some for honorable use and some for dishonorable. So if anyone purifies himself from anything dishonorable, he will be a special instrument set apart, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. But reject foolish and ignorant disputes because you know that they breed quarrels. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but must be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. Perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Pray with me this morning. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you gave Timothy Paul to give him a picture of what it means to be diligent as a disciple maker, what it means to be purified for use, what it means to be the Lord's servant. God, would we to follow the instructions that you inspired Paul to give Timothy. Because God, we want to do the hard work of being disciple makers. So open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to you in this place today as we take our next step on this journey together. And it's in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You may be seated. So last week, I pulled up my new toy, this digital blackboard, uh, to show you a model of disciple making that I have learned from our missionaries and those who work uh, in mission equipping and in disciple making context throughout the world. I want to put that up on the screen for you again uh, as we get started today. I want to remind you that uh, there are those, right? There are four chairs here. Again, don't judge my artistic merit, uh, but those four chairs help us to understand the stages of spiritual development. Um, that Jesus seemed to understand that, that people went through and that Paul understood as well. And so at, at that first chair, we have people who are lost and we want to share the gospel with them. Jesus' invitation was to come and see. And then, of course, for new believers, that invitation is to grow deeper, is to, to, to follow him. And so we rethink everything in our life based on who Jesus is. What Paul is primarily talking to Timothy about and where our focus is today is on this movement from chair three over here to chair four. This idea of how do we move from growing to multiplying? How do we understand the task that's ahead of us? 
And so that's the focus that Paul is giving to Timothy. And so if we're going to be a disciple who multiplies disciples, the first category in this section that Paul gives Timothy is, is that number one, we need to be a diligent worker for the word of truth. We need to be a diligent worker for the word of truth. A diligent worker keeps the main thing, Jesus, the main thing. Here's the way Paul begins this section. Remind them of these things. Well, what are these things? If we go back to the section that we looked at last week, we remember that Paul quoted from an early Christian hymn talking about the fact that even when we struggle to be faithful, Christ is faithful to us. In other words, these things are the gospel. Now, it's important for us in our day and age to remember we shouldn't translate it this way. Remind them of our things, because that's what we like to remind people about. Our opinions, our preferences, our likes. But Paul was constantly pushing Timothy to choose his battles wisely, to remember that what he was going to do was be to, to draw people to the gospel of truth. And so what are the words specifically that Paul's talking about? Flip with me over a couple of pages to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. And so, of course, this was a letter written to Timothy earlier, but the same battles were existing in the church in which, to which Timothy was leading and pastoring. 1 Timothy 6, verse 3 says, If anyone teaches false doctrine and does not agree with the sound teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and with the teaching that promotes godliness, he is conceited and understands nothing but has an unhealthy interest in disputes and arguments over words. So the words, right, that Paul is addressing here, right, are the words that are divisive, the words that lead people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ and sound teaching. He goes on to say, from these come envy, quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, and constant disagreement. We don't ever have that in our world today, do we? There's no envy. There's no quarreling, slander, evil suspicions, constant disagreement. Yes, those things are constantly happening in our world. Why? Because our world is divided on the subject of truth. And so there's this idea out there in a relativistic world that what goes for you goes for you, what goes for me goes for me, that subjective, uh, truth is subjective rather than objective. And so one of the things that Paul is pointing out to Timothy is if you're going to be a disciple maker, then you have to ground people in the truth of the word of God. And so what he points out is this is useless and leads to the ruin of those who listen. That word for ruin can be translated catastrophe. Translation, when we don't lead and guide people into the word of truth, what happens in their lives is a catastrophe because they begin to build their life on things that are less than God's truth. They begin to build their lives on foundations that won't hold up when the storm comes. They begin to follow paths that seem right unto a man, as it says in Proverbs, but in the end lead to what? Death. They're dead end paths, as we're going to see in just a few moments, that this metaphor for the path is incredibly important because a diligent worker has to work hard to correctly teach the word of truth. In verse 15, Paul says, Be diligent, work hard, to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who doesn't need to be ashamed. He's not ashamed of the gospel, correctly teaching the word of truth. That word for correctly teaching means rightly handled. It's translated that way in some of your translations. But specifically, it means to cut straight. And the word picture, some thinks it comes from the work of stonemasons, but others think it comes from the work of people who make highways, who cut a path for others to walk on. And so what you're doing when you rightfully teach the word of truth, when you handle the word of God carefully, when you teach sound doctrine, is you are paving the way for other people to understand God and his character. It's a pretty compelling word picture, isn't it? Because let's be honest, we live in a community that grew really fast and roads are an issue here. Can I get an amen? And we know, right, the frustration it causes when the roads aren't what they need to be. And so here Paul is saying, 
If you want to be a disciple maker, then you have got to pave a way. You have to clear some brush for folks. You have to do the hard work. Road construction is gritty, difficult, backbreaking work. It's why it takes so long. You've got to clear the site. You've got to lay a foundation. You've got to put uh, the paving on top. And so in the same way, we have to work hard to get the word of truth into the lives of God's people. It's been often said that more heresy happens during the Bible study hour in churches than any other time. Do you know why? Because a lot of teachers, and again, I was the world's worst small group leader. I used to do this with my youth group when I first started. I'd read a passage, and then the first question I would ask, I was well-intentioned, but I wanted to get people engaged. I would say, what does this passage mean to you? That's where the heresy comes in, right? Because here's the reality. It doesn't matter what it means to you. The question is, what does this passage mean, question mark, amen? And then we apply that truth to our lives. But we have to diligently work to get the word of truth into the lives of the ones that we are shaping for Christ. And when we don't, Paul gives us a pretty gross and a pretty vivid illustration here for us to understand the consequence. He says, avoid this irreverent and empty speech since those who engage in it will produce even more godlessness and their teaching will spread like gangrene. Gangrene happens when blood flow is cut off to an extremity of the body and the cell tissue literally begins to die. It can happen quickly, right? It spreads. Quick little funny story. Our church in East Nashville, the Lachlan Springs campus, a couple of years ago, we uh, had a sermon on 2 Timothy 1 through 7. Well, the reader that day who was reading scripture at that campus thought it was 217. And so the reader got up and said, and their teaching will spread like gangrene. Hymenaeus and Philetus are among them. All right, let's pray. Wow. All right. So build a sermon out of that. But there's a message here for us, isn't there? And Paul isn't hesitant to name names. When you don't teach the truth, the word here, right, is miss the mark. And false teachers miss the mark. And when they do, it doesn't just affect them, but it has consequences. It spreads throughout the body of Christ like a bad case of gangrene. And so one of the things that we have to address in our world today is the rise of relativism and tolerance being the key value. I love what Pastor Rick Warren from Saddleback Community Church in California has to say. I want to put this quote for you up on the screen. He says, our culture has accepted two huge lies. The first is that if you disagree with someone's lifestyle, you must fear or hate them. The second is that to love someone means that you agree with everything they believe or do. Both are nonsense. You don't have to compromise convictions to be compassionate. Amen? Such a good word for us today. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. Rightfully teaching Timothy, you have to handle the truth. And at the same time, the most loving thing you can do sometimes is to call out error doctrinally. The most loving thing you can do is point out to somebody that they're headed down the wrong path that in the end leads to death. The best thing that you can do sometimes is to lovingly come along someone, uh, side someone and say, this road, it seems good to you now, but I've watched this play out in people's lives and in the end it leads to death. So, a disciple who multiplies disciples is a diligent worker for the word of truth. Second thing that Paul gives Timothy in this passage today has to do with Timothy's lifestyle. A multiplier is a clean vessel for God to use. Paul picks up a household illustration. Verse 20, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but there are also wood and clay, some for honorable uses and some for dishonorable. So he uses kind of an everyday illustration. You walk in your kitchen and there is the fine china and there is the cheap plastic, so to speak. My grandmother was an artist. She was a painter. And so she painted beautiful flowers on china. Anytime my mom started getting that china out of the china cabinet, I knew that somebody special was coming over for dinner. Flip side, when it was just me and my brothers and she was tossing out the plastic ware and the old reused Cool Whip, you know, containers and the old butter containers full of leftovers, it was just another night at the Strawler household. And so there's a purpose for both. 
But Paul's point here is is that God appoints people to serve his kingdom in unique ways. And so what we want to be is we want to set ourselves apart to be sure that we are cleaned and ready for use. What does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 2? That you are God's workmanship. The word in the Greek, poema, where we get the English word poem. You are God's masterpiece, his artwork. And he has prepared in advance good works for you to do. And so why do some of us feel like, well, God doesn't use me very much? Well, one, I think, is because we're just flat out disobedient. But another one is, is that we're not always prepared for God to use us. So when God says, now's the time to have that gospel conversation, our conscience rises up within us and we're like, God, I'm not worthy for you to use me. I'm not ready. I'm not on my spiritual game. And there are so many missed opportunities, right? Because we have allowed something, temptation, sin, to come in and creep into our life. And we're not spiritually on our game and prepared for God to use us. The classic illustration, of course, is that of the dish, just like Paul is using. We've all had that moment before when we went to the, the cupboard, right? And we're going to get a bowl of cereal. And we pull down the bowl and we begin to pour the cereal. And then we notice that bowl didn't get washed well. And so there is something, and it might be kind of green, black, brown, crusted on the bottom, you know, or maybe you stuck something in the dishwasher and it wasn't fully wiped off yet, and now it's like crusted hard on there. And so if you're a woman, you put it away and you get another bowl. If you're a guy, you're like, "Mm, how gross is this really, right? So because you're tempted to just kind of go ahead and use it if it's not that bad, that's me anyway. I don't know about you guys. But you evaluate, right, am I going to use this utensil, this object, based on is it clean, is it fit, is it ready for use? And so part of what Paul is reminding us of is that our belief, the first part of this passage, right, has to be in line with sound doctrine and the truth of the word of God. But our behavior matters to the kingdom as well. We want others to not only follow our words, but our way of life. Well, how do we do this? Well, that is verse 22. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And so we are called to not only flee, right, but to follow, to pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. We're called to take that energy that we would normally expend on ourselves, a lot of times getting ourselves into trouble and thinking about and doing things we don't need to be doing, and we're to channel it. I have a 12-year-old son who lives in my home, and so he wakes up every morning with boundless amounts of energy, My wife and I know if we don't direct that energy, right, then it's not going to be good for us as the day goes on. My wife will tell you after parenting three girls and then now a boy, her rule about boys is if you don't find a job for them, they will make one for you. Amen, boy moms out there. And so that's what we have discovered. And so to that point, right, Paul is telling us as disciple makers, man, flee. Flee from the stuff that is impure and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. That's where our energy needs to go. And when we do that, then God uses us, can move in and through us in a powerful way. And this leads us to the third thing, the third word picture that Paul is going to give Timothy. And it's simply this. A disciple who multiplies disciples is the Lord's servant. It's the best word for it. He uses the word doulos, bondservant, right? Even the the word picture of of a slave in the idea that because of what Jesus has done for us, we now, right, want to serve him fully. And that's the word picture that is here. But reject foolish and ignorant disputes because you know that they bring quarrels. The Lord's servant must not quarrel, but be gentle to everyone, able to teach and patient, instructing his opponents with gentleness. So the first thing we need to see there is that a servant chooses his battles wisely. To be clear, when Paul tells Timothy not to quarrel, right, not to argue, he's not saying that there aren't things worth arguing for. If you're a preacher, a teacher, a communicator of the gospel, a small group leader, as you teach God's word, it is going to come in direct conflict with the values of this world, and you're going to have to take a stand. Paul is talking about fighting for what we would call those first-tier theological issues. If you caught it in the text, 
Hymenaeus and Philetus, these guys, we don't know much about them, but we know that they weren't teaching the truth about the resurrection, which is a first tier issue. And so we have to fight for those first tier issues. And Paul isn't afraid to name names and to call these men out. Why? Because if he doesn't, then the path that people go on will be led to destruction. Now, we have to choose wisely. There are what we would call second tier issues. There are even third tier issues theologically that sometimes we have to agree to disagree on. In other words, these are things that are not essential for salvation. But issues like the the incarnation of Jesus, his nature is fully man and fully God, the Trinity, the resurrection, all of these things are first tier issues. And we have to be willing to take a stand on those issues. There's an old saying that comes from the Reformation. It says, in the essentials of Christianity, unity. We need to be unified on those. In the non-essentials, there's some degree of liberty because someone who loves the Lord and follows his word might come to some slightly different conclusions about non-essential issues to salvation. And then at last, the reformers would say, but in all things, charity or love. And so sometimes that love, as I already mentioned, is a tough love that needs to confront. But what that means is, is that we need to be careful of our witness and we need to remember that it's not our agenda that we're serving, but it's the Lord's. And that's what he goes on to say, right? A servant not only chooses his battle wisely, but a servant is one that God uses to bring people to salvation. Verse 25, perhaps God will grant them repentance, leading them to the knowledge of the truth. Then they may come to their senses and escape the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do his will. Lord willing, that's what we want God to use all of us to do, right? Point people to the truth. Lead them away from error. Guide them in how to live as pure people, holy people. Be holy as I am holy, says in Leviticus. It says in 1 Peter. We want God to use us and as an example of his grace and what he can do in and through us. That's who we want to be as God's people. And we do this, Paul uses this word twice, with gentleness. Now, as we've already noted, gentleness doesn't mean what we think it does. Paul didn't back down from anybody or anything. But what it means, and this is beautiful in the original language, strength under control. Strength harnessed for the good of the gospel, not my personal opinions. Strength getting the gospel out, pursuing righteousness, purity, love. Those are the things that we are supposed to be about as God's people and as disciple makers. So with that being said, let's apply that to what we do in biblical community together as groups and as God's people. I want to put, go back to my digital whiteboard and I want to put up on the screen in front of you our disciple making strategy. And so what I want you to see is, is that right in the middle of this, of course, the sweet spot of this model is disciples multiplying disciples. That's what we're after. As Luke mentioned earlier, that happens when we do three things. When we engage in gospel conversations, more about that next week, when we go to share the good news with others, but where we grow, of course, is in groups. And so one of the things that, of course, Paul's instructing Timothy to do is to guide his group, his church at Ephesus, into maturity in Christ. There are three components of that that we break down. We call those grow, care, and equip. So our takeaways today as we apply this passage are literally grow, care, and equip. As we move from chair three to chair four, we learn how to do this together as God's people. So takeaway number one for us is this. In our disciples, multiplying disciples groups, we grow together diligently in our knowledge and application of the truth. We grow together in our knowledge and application of the truth. I tell you often, I can't feed you in 30 minutes a week all you need from the Word of God. I can only make you more hungry. And some of you love to remind me, Jay, I don't think you've ever preached a sermon that was 30 minutes, right? Maybe a little bit more, okay, more or less, 30 minutes. But you get the point. If all you were to do to nourish your body was to sit down and eat 30 minutes a week, if you were depending on this moment every week to be all the biblical content that you get, it's not enough. So what do you do with your group? What do you do in your home? Well, you dive back into the Word. You have the conversation this evening, this afternoon, around your dinner table, at lunch, with your group tonight. Tonight. 
hey, how can I be more diligent at knowing the word of truth and getting that word of truth into my life and into the life of the people around me? You see, that's where those conversations need to take place. That dialogue happens in which iron sharpens iron and we challenge each other to grow. We need to do that in biblical community because, again, left by ourselves, we tend to run down all kinds of side streets and dark alleys where we tend to get off base from time to time. And in healthy biblical community, we have brothers and sisters who help us to see the truth and to see how it applies to more people than just me. Not only that, in DXD groups number two, we care for one another by pursuing holiness together. When we think about that word care, we automatically think pastoral care, and that's an important function of community. I love to watch the way that you guys love on and encourage and serve each other. Every time somebody's having a baby going to the hospital, you guys have accepted and adopted the truth that Baptists say I love you with a casserole as well as any church I know. You guys show up with food. You encourage each other. I hear stories about the text messages back and forth, right? The just timely word that you give each other. But there's more to caring for each other than just food, right? There's also the opportunity that we have to say, let's pursue Christ together. We need that. We have a world that pulls us away from him and his truth and holiness in every way imaginable. But when you're in discipling, true discipling relationships like Paul and T- was with Timothy, you can be honest. And you can say, man, I see this in your life and I'm concerned for you. You can say, hey, I'm struggling with this and I need you to be with me in this. That's part of what we do as a group. We care for one another by pursuing holiness together so that God can use us and that we are ready to go when he calls. And last but certainly not least, we, number three, equip others and each other to be God's servant for the sake of the gospel. As your pastor, I don't want you to just join a group for the sake of joining a group. I want you to join a a disciple-making team. I want that group that you meet with to constantly be in a conversation. Who are the lost people that God's put around us? How can we pray for them? Hey, I'm struggling to really get the gospel through to to this person. Here's the situation. Can you give me counsel? Can you help me clarify how I need to present the gospel? Which issues, right? First tier, second tier, third tier. Which issue is this? And and how strong do I need to be? And, And help me have some wisdom. We do that together. And as we go out and we serve the community like we're going to do next Saturday, that is allowing our light to shine before men, not so that we get the glory, but so that they will say, There's something about those people, the way that they love to serve the community, the way they're always talking about Jesus. I don't know this Jesus, but I want to get to know him, right? That's the power of missional biblical communities working together to point people to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I know it feels overwhelming. I know you sit out there and you're like, man, what Paul was giving Timothy, these these are weighty things. To point people to the word of truth, to live a pure and holy life, to, to be the servant of the Lord. Man, that is so tough. I want to remind you that it's not you, but the power of the gospel at work within you. We sang about it this morning. It's the power of Christ right in me that does all of this. And I also want to remind you of this. Your pastor led the world's worst small group, (laughs) right? We all start somewhere. I struggled with this, but I also want to tell you this, not because of me, but because I had a Paul in my pastor who encouraged me, taught me how to get the gospel into the lives of these young men. Did you know out of those first seven young men I had within the first year, five of them accepted Christ. I baptized three of them after that first year. And do you want to know what happened in my life? That hooked me. When Jesus said, be a fisher of men, I was like, this is what it's like. And if God can use me in some small way to share his word of truth, to see his word change lives, well, then that's what I want to be a part of for the rest of my life. And you can be a part of that too. Will you take the step? Will you say, yes, Jesus, will you use me? as your disciple, who simply wants to see other disciples made. Will you bow your heads with me this morning as we come to this time of response? We call this our prayer at altar moment because this is a moment 
when we are reminded that we are called to be living sacrifices. When we're called to lay aside our preferences, our agenda, our things, as Paul calls it, and we're to surrender to the gospel. So today, my question for you in this moment is, what step do you need to take? What seat are you in? And will you say yes to moving up into that next seat as Jesus invites you to turn from your sin and yourself to him as savior? Will you move, right, from being just a baby Christian to one that wants to grow? And if you're a Christian who's growing, serving, but yet you feel like you're still missing something, will you say yes to the call, to the invitation to be a multiplier? to be someone that God uses to disciple others so that the fruit will be, as Jesus said, 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold, simply because you were obedient to allowing Jesus to work in and through you. Wherever you're at today, would you bring your obedience? Would you bring your faithfulness and your submission? before the throne of almighty God, who has already won the victory on the cross, has already showed his conquering of sin and death at the resurrection, so that his spirit could work in and through all of us who know him. Let's pray together this morning that we would be faithful in response to a God who is faithful to us. Let's pray together.